there it is. Let's try this again. Good evening. Thanks for being here with us tonight on this Good Friday. We gather tonight to worship and remember Jesus as he willingly gave himself up on the cross out of love for us and to, de and to defeat sin, death, and evil. Tonight is a night that is somber, but also moves us to deep gratitude that the God of the universe might make himself nothing and take on the weight of sin and failure and death in our place. Two weeks ago, we learned that long ago, a king was promised in the books of First and Second Samuel. And then this last Sunday, we were shown that the promised king was none other than Jesus himself. He was not the king everyone expected, but as we will see tonight, he is the king that everyone needed. He entered the city with humility and meekness, and he walked that same path into his own death. And we'll see tonight that he established his kingdom, not through might and violence, but through sacrificial love and suffering. King Jesus conquers all through suffering and death. He was forced to wear a scarlet robe, but he willingly took on the scarlet sin of the world. He was adorned with a crown of thorns for his own suffering, but instead he offers us a crown of glory. And so as we prepare to worship our king tonight, just listen to the story of his death as told by the Gospel of Matthew and allow your heart to consider his deep love and suffering. This is Matthew chapter 27, starting in the 27th verse. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you were the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at, at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. And so would you worship the Son of God tonight, our suffering King? You guys can choose to stand and worship.
Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. Well, as Billy said, we want to thank you guys for coming out tonight uh, for our Good Friday uh, service. Um, Part of Holy Week that many of you guys have been participating in uh, with us at the church uh, this week. That began last Sunday on Palm Sunday. Uh, in which we took time as a congregation to look at the arrival of the promised king uh, from the Old Testament, that king that had been promised from the family of Abraham, who had been promised uh, to come from the tribe of Judah, and who had been promised to come from, uh, would be a descendant of King David. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, presenting himself Uh, as that long-awaited promised king uh, in a most unlikely fashion, uh, presenting himself uh, in humility and humble. But that marked the beginning of a week of conflict for Jesus uh, and his disciples in and around the city of Jerusalem uh, that would culminate uh, with his arrest uh, and his beating and his crucifixion. Uh, And that is what we come tonight and we gather around as uh, followers of Jesus to remember. Uh, It is a unique, uh, interesting, perplexing, mysterious moment uh, in the history of the world. And for the last 2,000 years, followers of Jesus have gathered and centered their life around his cross. And what it has meant uh, for not only his people, but for the world as well. Billy began our service reading Matthew's account of that night uh, or that day, uh, Jesus' crucifixion, found in Matthew chapter 27. All four Gospels record this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Matthew has a, a unique Uh, a few unique pieces, and I wanted to look at Matthew's gospel, but use them to springboard back into the book of Psalms this evening. You see, in Matthew chapter 27, after Jesus has been placed on the cross, it says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. It's an odd time of day for there to be darkness. So if you were present that day, you would have been caught off guard by this in the middle of the day. And it says about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now we read that in Matthew and, and it, it would, In one sense, you, 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 you hear in Jesus' voice the suffering. You, you 
hear in his tone that he feels abandoned. He feels left all alone here placed on the cross. But that phrase in particular is actually a direct quote from Psalm 22. And so as we have begun to piece the story of the Bible together as a congregation, when we see phrases like that, it should call us back to where Jesus is quoting. And so this evening, I'd like to turn our attention to Psalm 22 to give us context and to interpret what is taking place on the cross. Because as Jesus is placed on the cross and is being crucified, in his mind, and what comes out of him is this psalm. He sees his death as directly connected to the words of David. And so let's go back this evening to look at Psalm 22 to gain some perspective on what is taking place. The first part of Psalm 22 lays out the suffering king, the first 21 verses. And many of these verses will be familiar to us. It begins with what Jesus cries out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. There is this aspect of this suffering one in Psalm 22 that the first few verses unpack as the spiritual suffering that this individual is experiencing. From his perspective, in his moment of suffering, He feels as though God has abandoned him. He feels in his suffering that he cries out and God does not listen. That's his experience. Now, we'll come back to this, but what's fascinating is verse 24 tells us that the father has not abandoned him, but that he has heard his cry. And what you'll see in these first 20 verses of Psalm 22 is this cry and this suffering and then something like verse 3 where he says, Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. You see this suffering of this individual in Psalm 22 that Jesus sees as himself. And yet, he continues to trust in the Father in his moment of suffering and pain and loss. Verse 6 speaks of the psychological suffering that this individual and Jesus in particular suffers. He says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. What what is it that the, the soldiers were mockingly saying to Jesus? If you are the son of God, then come down. In our week this week, we've set up these pieces of art, the stations of the cross, and there's normally 12. Tonight, there's 11. But it starts there, one, two, and it goes around the room. And as I walked through it this week, one of the ones that spoke most deeply to me was number four, where Jesus is mocked. And I thought about how in my own life, people's perception of me and people's treatment of me is so important. 
And I thought about just the experience of being ostracized, selected out of the crowd to be mocked and ridiculed. And what that does psychologically to humans. One of the things I always tell my kids before they leave for school is look for the people that don't ha- have friends. Look, look for the ones that, that nobody notices or the ones that people mock. Why? Because it is so formative for humans to be mocked. It is so utterly painful. And Jesus in Psalm 22 and in Matthew 27 is mocked ruthlessly. He says in verse 9, yet (laughs) the spiritual suffering is real for Jesus, yet he continues to trust. The psychological suffering for Jesus is unbelievably real, yet, verse 9, yet you are he who took me from the womb, You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Verse 12 begins to describe the physical suffering that Jesus will endure. And he uses metaphor and and imagery to describe what he's experiencing on the cross. This is his experience. He says, verse 12, Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. He sees himself surrounded, attacked. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. It's clearly a description in Psalm 22 of crucifixion. Crucifixion was common in Jesus' day. It is something that he would have grown up around and seen. It was the preferred method of punishment for slaves and rebels by the Roman government. If you've ever heard the story of Spartacus, Spartacus was a rebel, and he caused a rebellion against Rome roughly a hundred years before Jesus lived. And this rebellion would end in the crucifixion of 6,000 rebels that followed him. And they would stretch these crosses over 130 miles, meaning that there was one person being crucified every 40 yards from here to Eugene. After the fall of Jerusalem, Rome would actually crucify so many Jewish rebels that they ran out of lumber in the area. And in between these historic mass crucifixions is the crucifixion of Jesus, who Rome sees as a rebel and no greater than a slave. Crucifixion was designed to be slow, could last for days. The Roman philosopher Seneca describes crucifixion as a long, drawn-out affair in which the victim would be wasting away in pain, dying limb by limb, letting out his life drop by drop. 
fastened to the accursed tree, long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly tumors on chest and shoulders, and drawing the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony. And this is what the psalmist describes in Psalm 22. And as Jesus is placed on the cross and he is being crucified, he references this. He prays this out. He cries this out. Ultimately, crucifixion was intended as a social and political statement to the one being crucified and to those watching. Socially, it makes the statement that Rome is superior and the individual is inferior. Politically, it is a powerful reminder that Rome is in charge and that the individual and their nation counts for nothing. It therefore had a theological or religious meaning as well. The goddess Roma and Caesar, the son of a god, were superior to any and all other gods. Thus, those who crucified people did so because it was the sharpest and nastiest way of asserting their own absolute power and guaranteeing their victims' absolute degradation. And that is the sense we would get if Psalm 22 stopped. All you would get is the impression of suffering. But Psalm 22 doesn't stop in 19 or 18. It says that through the suffering of the one identified in Psalms and who Jesus says is himself in Matthew 27, through suffering, through the loss, through the death, somehow, mysteriously, supernaturally, God is setting the world right. Psalm 22 goes on in the same way that the first part did in verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 9. He says in verse 19, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And verse 22 is the shift from suffering to victory because this, this psalmist says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not... He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him. But he has heard when he cried to him. You see, Rome crucifies to to communicate that this one is stricken by God, abandoned by God, left desolate by God who is nothing compared to the might and power of Caesar. And yet Psalm 22 says God has not abandoned him, but he has heard the cry of the one who suffers. And he has delivered him. From you comes my praise, verse 25, in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall bow before you. We move from this suffering to this triumph. He says, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. 
All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him and it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. That language, he has done it, is incredibly similar to the language used in John's gospel when Jesus cries out at the end, it is finished. And so he begins his time on the cross My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he ends it. It is finished. He, God, has done it through the suffering of the king. He has brought triumph and victory. The book of Hebrews ties these themes together for us and once again helps us understand what is taking place, both in Psalm 22 and on the cross, because the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 2, 8 through 15, (laughs) Siri, just button in. Hebrews 2, 8 through 15 says, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present... We do not see everything in subjection to him. That's our experience this morning or this evening. But we see him for a little while, Jesus, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. He was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctifies, sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying what? I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Where is that from? Psalm 22. He says, through suffering, he was glorified. And through this triumph, he has created this new people that now are sanctified through him. And he quotes another psalm, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death, through suffering, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Through suffering, the suffering one is perfected. Through suffering, he identifies with his people. And through suffering, he has accomplished victory over death and the devil. And this is precisely how God has become king. And that is the sign that was placed over Jesus' cross. King of the Jews. N.T. Wright says, nailing the royal badge to the cross was a way of saying, this is the king of the Jews. This is what Israel's God is doing. This is how he is becoming king. Not just the king of Israel, but the king of the world. And so in that moment, a strange king was revealed. A king who would rule not by force and power like Caesar and Rome, but a king who would rule by love and self-giving. And this is what we remember tonight. So as Steph comes back up and we sing a song in between communion, may the words of Jesus shared with us from Matthew's gospel 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That takes us back to Psalm 22 to understand what exactly is taking place where we see the spiritual, the psychological, the physical suffering of the king. May we meditate on that tonight, but may it take us to the place that Hebrews took us. That through this suffering, through this death, Christ was perfected. That he identifies with us and that he defeats the evil one and frees us from the fear of death. And that it was in this act that rather than ruling by force and power, God would show us that he rules through love. And this is why 1 John tells us that in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So take a moment as the communion elements are passed and we sing this song to meditate on that, and then we'll come back together and we'll take communion.
on that Thursday night um, of Jesus' last week prior to his crucifixion, so the night before he was crucified, he gathered his disciples uh, together in an upper room, <clears throat> and he gave them what we now refer to as communion or the Eucharist. And he gave us two elements, uh, bread and wine, uh, bread and juice to remember um, what would take place the next day. He connects these elements to his body and his blood that would be blessed, broken, and given to the world in 24 hours. And the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he says, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you have the bread, Jesus took that, he blessed it, says that he broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples. So you may take the bread in remembrance of him. It says, and in the same way, he took the cup after supper. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What is it that we're proclaiming? We're proclaiming his victory, his triumph, his identification with us, his defeat of evil, sin, and death. And every time we gather and we, we take the bread and we bless it, we break it, we give it, we eat it, and we take the cup, we proclaim that to ourselves, to each other, and to the world that watches. And so may you take the cup this evening as a sign of his new covenant in his blood. Would you guys stand this evening? as we close in a song and then Michael will come give the benediction. Lord, I come I Without you, I fall apart. You are the one oh, who guides my heart. Lord, I
Good Friday by Christina Rossetti. Am I a stone and not a sheep that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross to number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss and yet not weep? Not so, not so those women loved who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and moon, which hid their faces in a starless sky, a horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I. Yet give not over, but seek thy sheep, true shepherd of the flock. Greater than Moses, turn and look once more and smite a rock. As you leave, receive these words of blessing. May our stone hearts be smitten this evening with the love and grace shown to us in the darkness of the cross and bring forth living water. And may the God who became Savior, our true shepherd, reveal the light that comes through this darkness to reveal his plan for his beloved stony sheep. Amen? Amen. Till Sunday. <laughs>